What's up, Earth's Mightiest Subscribers? It's Blur Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, today's video, we're going to be talking about Avengers X-Men Eternals Judgment Day number one by Kieran Gillen and Valerio Skeety. And in this video, I'm going to be breaking down exactly why the Eternals are waging war on all mutants, as well as why the Avengers no longer trust the Eternals, but normal humans do. And last, but most certainly not least, how the Eternals just shit on not just the X-Men, but Krakoa and planet Arako as a whole, and how another group of Eternals plans to save everyone. You can't see me, you Stevie, wondering how I reach more evolutions than Eevee and make it look easy. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and get this out of the way. If you've not been keeping up with Karen Gillen's Eternals, well, for one, shame on you. That is literally one of the best comics in Marvel right now, or at least it was uh, up until its 12th issue where it was ended. That comic is probably the best place to go for information about what's going on here with Judgment Day because all of it stems from Gillen's run, the reasoning behind why the Eternals are doing a lot of what they're doing right now. And I'll go ahead and give you a brief summary of what has been going on just for the sake of this video. What you need to know is that during Karen Gillen's run, the Eternals discovered that when they die, the machine that is ultimately the planet Earth that they are charged with protecting whenever an Eternal dies, the machine or Earth resurrects them. But in order for the machine to resurrect an Eternal, a random human has to die. One human life to bring back an Eternal life. And the Eternals, once they discovered that this is how they were being resurrected all these years, they decided to separate themselves from Eternal society. A lot of people tend to think of the Eternals as a team, and Cersei brings this up in this issue, basically saying that no, we are a society, a community of people. The Eternals that you know as heroes aren't really a team, we're just a small group of an even bigger whole. And the core Eternals have gone into hiding in the depths of Lemuria, which is the home of the Deviants, because they want to learn how to break the cycle how to do the one thing that they've never been able to do. All of the awesome, amazing cosmic power that Eternals possess, the one thing they can't do is change, and that's something that the Deviants are quite skilled in. But while all this was going on, Thanos was able to take control of the Eternals, dethroning Zurus, who has been Prime Eternal for pretty much almost the entirety of the time that the Eternals have ever been a thing. And once he became Prime Eternal, he took the character Druid as his advisor. And Thanos wanted nothing more than to make himself a part of the machine. Thanos is, for all intents and purposes, an Eternal, even if he is an unofficial one. He was technically born of Eternals, but Eternals Eternals aren't able to have children who become Eternals. So technically, he is an anomaly, both he and his brother Eros. But what Thanos wanted to do was cement himself as a part of the machine, and in efforts to trying to do this, the rest of the Eternals realized that if Thanos became a true Eternal connected to the machine, then he would be able to die and come back automatically anytime he wished, and more importantly, a human would have to die to bring him back, and they couldn't stand by that either. And as Thanos had dethroned Zurus using treachery, mostly on the part of Druig, Druig used treachery to get rid of Thanos, activating the failsafe in Thanos that the Eternal Fastest put within Thanos when he brought him back to life the last time. So Thanos currently is dead once again, and Druig is the leader of the Eternals, and he knows that being the leader of the Eternals is not something he's going to be able to maintain just on good looks alone. He's going to have to come up with something that's going to make the other Eternals appreciate him and want to keep him around. And what better way to keep the Eternals calm and happy is to give them a war that satisfies their urge to maintain their third directive, which is to correct excess deviation. And right now, Druig has recognized that the excess deviation going on Earth right now is mutant kind. This is not necessarily new information. It's always kind of been hinted that mutants in the Marvel Comics universe are potentially deviants, but no one's ever really leaned into that narrative. And now Kieran Gillen is doing just that. He's leaning into that narrative, proving that mutants are in fact deviants, which makes them the arch nemesis of the Eternals, who it's their job to destroy all deviants. Druig has already tried to use an antimatter bomb to get rid of Krakoa, but we learned in AXE Eve of Judgment number one that Krakoa is connected to the machine because of the nature of its existence. The fact that it is a living island means it's a part 
of Earth, which is the machine. So destroying any part of the machine is going to go against the prime directives of the Eternals, meaning that Druig would be killed for going against it. Automatically, no one has to do this to him. The machine would literally just kill him. We saw this in that issue. So this is why Druig is going hard body against the mutants. He is putting the Eternals against the mutants to distract them from him. That way he can keep them happy, but also keep them from looking directly at him and what he's doing. So that way he can secure himself as the Prime Eternal for centuries, if not millennia to come. Now, as for the reason why the Avengers are not trusting the Eternals right now, and what kind of keeps the Avengers in what is otherwise more of an X-Men versus Eternal story arc, is that the Avengers recently, as of the last few issues of Karen Gillan's Eternals run, were infiltrated by the Eternals. The Eternals, Ajak and Makari, they came up with a plan to get the rest of the Eternals in on what was essentially a heist. What they were trying to do is break into Avengers Mountain, which was formerly the Progenitor Celestial, the first Celestial that ever came to Earth. This all kind of goes more back into the uh, Jason Aaron Avengers run, the very first, uh, you know, five issues of Jason Aaron's Avengers run, if you haven't read it, basically what you need to know is that the Progenitor is a Celestial that died on the planet and unleashed an army of parasites that the Avengers had to come together to stop. This was also something that the Avengers of 1 million BC had to deal with back in their day. Fast forward to now, and that same progenitor Celestial being cured of those parasites, ridden of them completely, the rest of the Celestials gave the progenitor as a gift to the Avengers. They've been using that gift as a base of operations. And Ajak and Makari, really more Ajak than Makari, they feel as though this is a slap in the face against them and what is essentially their religion. The Eternals worship the Celestials, and Ajak is of the mind that the Avengers had misinterpreted what the Celestials were telling them. But when Ajak and Makari got into the heart of Avengers Mountain and questioned the spirit of the dead Celestial within, they learned that no, everything that they were told in Eternal Celestia number one was true. Ghost Rider was not lying to them that the Celestials gave the progenitor to them as a gift. Ajak felt as though this was a slight. Ajak learned something very disturbing in her time interrogating the Celestial, that the Deviants are the ones that are actually important to the Celestials, not the Eternals. Now, it was already proven that the Eternals' true purpose was not just to protect the Celestials and the machine and correct excess deviation, but they learned that they were also meant to protect humans, to keep them safe and help cultivate them as they begin to thrive and gain powers and mutate into what could essentially become antibodies against that alien parasite horde that I mentioned earlier. But that wasn't the only thing. There was always this hint that there was something more to what the Celestials wanted out of the Eternals, and now Ajak knows what that is. And I'm going to go on a limb and say, while they don't exactly say that it is mutants, but Celestials want to protect mutants. They want to correct excess deviation, sure, but I don't think the Celestials want to correct excess deviation, like meaning to kill and cull it willy-nilly. I think what they want is that they don't want the wrong deviants to excessively grow and mutate and perpetuate themselves. And I think that's what Ajak just learned. She doesn't say it out loud, but she does definitely say that the deviants are the important ones. And we all know right now, mutants are considered deviants. Otherwise, what is this war even for? That said, while the Avengers no longer trust Eternals, Druig has made sure that humanity as a whole believes in the Eternals by sending out a worldwide message to everyone's smartphones, basically telling them that the mutants have gotten out of hand with the recent revelation by Cyclops to the world that mutants are able to be resurrected and cannot die permanently. Humanity has responded in very wild and very different ways with some humans namely the rich elite wanting that resurrection technology for themselves, every other bog standard normal human, they either want to become mutants so that they can be resurrected or feel like resurrection shouldn't just be something that only mutants have, normal humans should have it and others are just questioning why their loved ones have died yet the X-Men have come back so many times. Others are just plain mad that resurrection is a thing and they don't have it. There's a lot of wide ranging you know, responses to this revelation and right now Druig is giving everybody what they want, an answer that makes them all feel better, and that's that the Eternals are here to defeat the X-Men and get rid of them once and for all, and not just the X-Men, 
but mutants as a whole. And humanity, by and large, is responding incredibly favorably to this. And while we don't see the entire world's reaction, we do see all the people who are protesting outside of the X-Men's treehouse in New York. Pretty much all of them are cheering that the Eternals are going to wipe out all of mutant kind. Now, don't get me wrong, humanity jumping on the bandwagon of the Eternals isn't that surprising considering their history with mutants, but don't expect humanity to be on the Eternals' bandwagon for too long. We can't forget that while, yes, humans are mad that mutants now not only have their own island, not only have their own Krakoan medicines, they have all this fancy technology, they have this new way of life, they also now have the ability to resurrect when they die. But if the mutants, or even the core Eternals, were to say, I don't know, reveal the secret that when an Eternal dies, in order for them to resurrect, that it kills a random human, I don't think humanity is gonna be laughing and dancing like they are right now in regards to Druig's announcement. Now that leads me to this, how is Druig gonna wipe out all mutants? He obviously already tried and he failed. What is he gonna do now? What is his next move? I believe that the best way for Druig to make sure that the mutants aren't able to perpetuate themselves is to get rid of the mutants that they know are responsible for resurrection. He knows this information thanks to Moira McTaggart. This is something he learned during the latter part of X-Men Hellfire Gala number one. And the conversation that he's having with Moira McTaggart just kind of continues on from there. It basically jumps from X-Men Hellfire Gala number one to what's going on right now and the message he's about to give to humanity. There's not really much more to Moira and Druk's conversation other than the fact that they both want the same thing. They want mutants gone, but for completely different reasons. One thing does make me wonder, because we know that Moira is working with Orcus, and we know that Orcus is trying to bring in another secret, shadowy member that they don't want to reveal who it is just yet, almost kind of reminds me of wrestling. It's like, hey, we have another member of the NWO, but we're not going to tell you who it is, but just wait, it's happening. You're going to see, brother. That's kind of what they're doing here, and I often wondered if it was a representative of some alien species, but now I'm starting to wonder if it's an Eternal. Like, after all this blows over, or even during the events of this, I wouldn't be surprised if Orcus made a move and revealed that one of their new board members is Druig, or another Eternal who is anti-mutant. It could even be Uranus, for Christ's sakes. But that said, how is Druig going to take out the mutants? Well, he does actually try to get rid of the Five. He's unsuccessful, as when he sends the Eternal Jack of Knives to assassinate the Five, he only manages to kill Egg, and while it looked like he killed Hope Summers at first, that wasn't actually the case. And while Jack of Knives did in fact fail, he wasn't the only assault that Druig sent in. He also got all of the other Eternals to come together, at least presumably not the rest of the core Eternals, because they're sitting this one out for the most part. But the other Eternals have come together and formed one of the most powerful weapons in all of Marvel Comics the Unimind. The Unimind is something incredibly potent and incredibly powerful. I'm not going to go too terribly deep into it, but if you want to know more about it, I actually have a video right up here where you can check that out. I break down the entirety of what the Eternals are all about. Even within that playlist, there's character breakdowns for each and every one of the other Eternals after it. So check that out if you want to know even more granular details about it, but just know that the Unimind is basically the sum total of every Eternal who's a part of it and combines all of their minds, their memories, their feelings, their thoughts, their powers, everything. This collective unit essentially makes the Eternals one of the most powerful forces in the universe. And right now they're using the Unimind to psychically attack every telepath on Krakoa to shut them down so that way, for one, it breaks down communication. It also takes some of the mutants' most powerful players off the table. Though admittedly, it doesn't work 100% as well as I think Druid would have liked. However, this was also not the prime reason that he did this. This, all of this, was nothing more than a distraction because while the mutants on Krakoa are dealing with all their telepaths being taken out as well as you know, an attack on the five themselves to shut down mutant resurrection. We also can't forget there's two other things that Druig has put in motion that the rest of the mutants were not planning on. One of the other main things is the Hex. The Hex is something that Kieran Gillen introduced back in his Eternals number seven. We didn't really know what they were though. There was no information really given about them. All we knew is that they were a thing. We know they're Eternals, that's it. But we learned in this issue, the Hex are very much Eternals, but they're Kaiju size Eternals. They look like some of the angels you would see in Neon Genesis Evangelion. Massive sized creatures with incredible power, presumably, and they have been unleashed on Earth to take out every mutant, period. 
like no questions asked. They're being sent after not just Krakoa, but after any mutant that's not on the island. Now, while humanity is happy that Druig is going after the mutants, I have a sneaking suspicion they're not gonna be crazy about how he's doing it because this could lead to a lot of collateral damage. And while we're talking about collateral damage, let's talk about the main weapon, the big gun that Druig has unleashed to take out planet Araco. If you've been keeping up with my coverage for the Eternals, you can check out this video up here to learn all about the character Yurnos, but Yurnos is one of the OG Eternals. Like I'm talking one of the first Eternals ever created by the Celestials. And he takes the third directive of the Celestials incredibly seriously, correcting excess deviation. We've seen this with pretty much every instance that he's been brought up where he is completely against the idea of even the slightest amount of deviation. He kind of goes by the one drop rule. You have one drop of deviant in you, you are too much deviation. He has culled entire species from the planet Earth for simple natural evolutions. He's laid waste to entire societies of deviants just to keep excess deviation from even becoming the slightest bit of a possibility. Now, to look at Uranus, you would probably think, wait a minute, this guy looks an awful lot like Thanos. And you wouldn't be wrong, he does. He actually does look an awful lot like Thanos, so he didn't used to always look that way. He actually used to look like a normal human back when he originally debuted in What If number 24 in 1980. But during Gillen's run, he's retconned the way that Uranus looks. And with that kind of comes a deeper connection to Thanos, because for all intents and purposes, Thanos' father, Mentor, is the nephew of Uranus. Though if you were to ask Thanos, despite the fact that Uranus is his grand uncle, Thanos seems to be of the belief that he's more like a grandfather to him, even if it's not by blood, that's just how he reveres Uranus, where at first he didn't seem to care for the guy, but then he realized they had a lot in common, and that a lot in common being mass genocide. And also a complete lack of to give. Uranus has been removed to the exclusion, which is basically exile for the Eternals. He's not allowed to go free. But Druig, knowing that he needs something to help him win this war against the mutants, he knows that Uranus is pretty much the one sure bet that he has. And he gives Uranus one hour to go out into the world and shut down mutants once and for all. And Uranus even boasts about how Humans take nine months to create the first breath of another human life, and it only takes mere seconds to snuff that same breath out. But that Uranus can do even more with just one hour, and we even see him literally counting down what are the last seconds of his hour, basically proving that he is the most powerful being, even more powerful than Thanos himself. Uranus has laid waste to the entire Great Ring of Araco, the leading body of Araki's mutant and with the recent additions of characters like Magneto and Storm, that includes them as well. Cable is also included in this, and I don't know if whether or not he just recently became a member of the Great Ring. We won't know until we see the next issue of X-Men Red. He is also included in this, so it makes me wonder if he didn't just destroy the Great Ring, it actually looks like he destroyed every mutant on Araco. The main idea for his attack was to get rid of of the external gates and any other gate on Araco that would allow that planet's mutant population to come in and help in the fight against the Eternals. But the way he talks about how whoever or whatever might be left makes it sound like, yeah, he took out just about every mutant that he saw. We don't even see what Yurdos does, but if it's based on anything that we've seen, in the case of Eternals, the heretic number one, we saw that Yurdos was more than capable of creating weapons of destruction so powerful that they can wipe out entire civilizations. We've watched him do this. I'm pretty sure he just did it again in this issue. He's very likely used that very same type of weapon again. A weapon that, for all intents and purposes, creates the same effect that I think a lot of us still remember from Avengers Infinity War. It literally turns everyone who's affected by it to dust. Only they're not going to the Soul Stone and coming back after a five-year time jump. No, everyone hit by this is bypassing the continue screen, going straight past the Gulag, straight to the hereafter. Well, at least that would be the case if they weren't mutants and had the ability to be resurrected. Now, bear in mind, an earlier panel in this comic shows us that Storm isn't on Araco when Uranus comes to lay the smack down. So it's safe to say Storm is okay. She's on Krakoa. It's Magneto who catches the L in her place 
on the Great Ring. So Magneto might be sitting this one out, at least for the first two core issues. We'll probably see him in one of the upcoming Judgment Day tie-ins for X-Men Red number four or five, I believe. Now, while Druig is putting the genie back into the bottle, Uranus does let us know that he is going to be back, and I have posited this as well. I think Uranus is going to wind up being the ultimate villain that's going to wind up unifying the X-Men, the Eternals, and the Avengers together as one unit against a common foe. I just see that coming. It just is what it is. But that's not the only thing that they have to worry about. We also know that Makari and Ajak are trying to create a new celestial god, something that can rewrite the Eternals' mandates and could help them get out of the situation that they're in, even if it is for selfish purposes. I don't think Ajak is 100% doing this out of benevolence. Ajak rarely if ever does anything that isn't self-serving. And as of AXE Eve of Judgment number one, as well as Immortal X-Men number four, we know for a fact that Makari and Ajak have Mr. Sinister captive and they plan to use him to help them create a new celestial god using Avengers Mountain. And while it isn't exactly confirmed that the ominous voice that we see the narration boxes of at the very beginning and end of this issue belong to the progenitor that is Avengers Mountain, but something tells me that's exactly what it is. They're gonna try and create a new celestial god with completely new mandates more in line with what the current Eternals want, or at the very least, what Ajak wants. I don't think Makari is going to have much of a say in this. For those who don't remember, Ajak and Makari have had quite the rivalry with one another and were bitter enemies not too terribly long ago. They have both been the speaker of the Celestials, the voice of the Celestials for the Eternals, and I just don't see this alliance that they have with each other that started in Eternal Celestia number one going any further than where it is right now. I believe that once Ajak gets what she wants, it's going to be open season on everyone, especially the Avengers, even though she's trying to work with them right now. We can't forget in Eternal Celestia number one, Ajak revealed that her and the Avengers, even going all the way back to the Avengers of 1 million BC, are bitter enemies. Trust me, Ajak has a long memory. She's not going to let that go. She had to be drug away from her fight against Ghost Rider. Ajak has no love for the Avengers. But anyways, that's everything I really wanted to talk about with AXE Judgment Day number one. This issue came out of the gate swinging. I love it. I was very skeptical about how I would feel about this event. And so far, I should have just known from the jump, it's Karen Gillan. <laughs> of course, he's going to deliver. Karen Gillan delivers all the time. And of course, he does the exact same thing here, and I am here for it. But anyways, if you want to know more information about the Eternals, what they are, and how each of their powers work, check out this video up here. And if you want to know more about why the character Uranus is going to be a whole problem for both the X-Men and the Avengers, as well as the rest of the Eternals, check out this video down here to learn more about that. In the meantime, let me know what you thought about Judgment Day number one. Keep it plus ultra, and sound off in the comments.